welcome everybody uh, and especially welcome to the applicants. Uh, feel free to uh, turn your cameras on, say hello. Uh, uh, this is a our regular weekly conference. Um, hopefully you'll get a sense for um, the, the type of uh, culture we have here in the division and the communication, even though it's a virtual, which uh, we are we are slowly getting used to, although also moving a lot of things back to hybrid and in person. Uh, but since you all are doing your interviews uh, virtually, this I think goes along with that. Uh, we're really thrilled that Dr. Elizabeth Monroe is presenting today. Uh, I will keep this informal, although I could easily do a really extensive introduction and embarrass her uh, with with many recent publications and, and accolades. Uh, she is a recent graduate of our program. She's a uh, on the T32. Uh, she was a chief resident at the University of Chicago before joining us for fellowship. And I think that the actual words that the uh, program director there told me were, oh, as she starts, you can just give her the keys to the ICU and you should be all set, uh, which we don't actually have keys to our ICU. Otherwise, we could have done that. Uh, and she has been working with Hallie Prescott and, and very rapidly become an expert in early sepsis management, peripheral vasopressors. She's had many presentations at national and international conferences now uh, and, a, and a lot of publications. And um, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for giving this presentation. And everybody feel free to put questions, comments, or thoughts in the chat. We'd really like to keep this informal and, and uh, conversation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jake, for that kind introduction. <laughs> um, so I'm excited to talk today about uh, a topic that I've become really interested in through my fellowship research and now as an early faculty of fluid resuscitation and septic shock. Um, and so like Jake mentioned, I want to get I wanted to give a little bit of background about myself for the applicants because I think um, I've had a number of opportunities through the fellowship here that I couldn't have gotten anywhere else that helped me um, with my success. And so I can't help but make a plug for Michigan and our fellowship program. Um, so like Jake mentioned, I came here from Chicago um, in 2020. I on During the, my fellowship, I was T32 research fellow starting 2022, which allowed me to complete a master's in healthcare and health services research, which really helped give me the tools and statistical background to do a lot of the work I've done. My research path is working with Dr. Hallie Prescott, who's my primary mentor and has expertise in sepsis and health services research, focusing on early sepsis management, peripheral vasopressors, as Jake mentioned. Um, but today, what we'll be talking about is early fluid resuscitation, and I'm moving towards becoming a, a clinical trialist in that area um, and preparing for case submission this year. So to get everyone um, started and thinking, I had the case, but to kind of talk about what we're going to be focusing on today, we're really going to be looking at this question of how much fluid should you give to a patient with sepsis-induced hypotension? And I really love this stock photo character because he's kind of expectantly waiting for an answer that we're going to tell him how much fluid to give. Um, and unfortunately, I'm not going to have the perfect answer for you, um, but my goal is going to be to go over the data that we do have. Um, and the guidelines that we have and kind of break those down to really give us a better understanding of how we should approach fluid across a patient's uh, admission with sepsis. So our learning objectives today, we'll be talking about why fluids matter. We'll be talking about the risks and the benefits. Um, we'll talk about the guidelines and evidence and then tools for assessing fluid responsiveness. So this is the answers that you all gave to the case. Um, so at the beginning, this was a man with uh, diabetes, coronary disease, and HEFREF, and he had pneumonia, and his blood pressure was low despite two liters, about 30 mils per kilogram of fluid. Um, and interestingly, we're, we're spanning the, the gamut here. Many people opted out uh, and said they would perform an assessment of fluid responsiveness, which is great. I love that. Um, and most people would either do vasopressors or more fluids, not a lot of people just giving more fluids. Excellent. So I want to highlight that the evidence-based answer, or sorry, before I do that, I want to say, have you just think. So if you had this case, would you have changed your mind and your answer if he had already gotten four liters of fluid? What if he was on a non-rebreather instead of four liters of oxygen? Would you have given, for those who said more fluid, would you have chosen to give less? What if his lactate was worsening despite fluids? Or on the contrary, what if you did the passive leg raise assessment and he was fluid responsive? So I'm sure that in your minds, many of you would have changed your answer based on those different um, that different clinical information, which makes it especially frustrating that the evidence-based answer to that question is any of the above. Um, so that's based on the 2023 Clovers trial, which we'll talk about in a little more depth. 
but it was patients with sepsis and ongoing hypotension after initial fluid and compared early initiation of vasopressors versus additional fluids up to five liters. And you can see here very similar mortality. So that kind of highlights the frustrations that a lot of us have had with these fluid studies. They have limitations. They generally take a one size fits all approach. And that's frustrating because fluid resuscitation, we kind of get a general sense from our practice that it may require personalization. So before we talk a little bit more about these fluid studies and how we should approach personalization, if we should, in fluid resuscitation, I want to talk for a minute about why we even give fluids. So this is a very simplistic breakdown of sepsis and septic shock and how it causes hypotension. But basically, the uh, the body responds to a pathogen by releasing cytokines, which cause capillary leak, vasodilation, which leads to hypotension and multi-organ failure. Again, that's fairly simplistic, but it helps us show why we give fluids. Fluids help us restore that intravascular volume, which increases the preload to the heart, which can help treat the hypotension, albeit sometimes just transiently, which can also help improve organ perfusion. So that is the reason that we have traditionally given fluids in septic shock. But there's growing um, acknowledgments of the potential harms of fluid. So this is, this, uh, I just love this figure from Malbrain um, et al. in Annals of Intensive Care Medicine that shows, shows all of the potential harms of fluid overload, which essentially boil down to organ edema. So if you give too much fluid, you may increase oxygen requirements, leading to longer times on the ventilator, which comes with many complications, as we know. You may cause brain edema, leading to impaired cognition, impaired wound healing, and impaired functional status in patients with really edematous legs who can't work with physical therapy. So there's a lot of potential harms of fluids. So what does the evidence say about fluids and the harms of fluids? So most of the evidence we have about the harms of fluids is from retrospective studies. I'm just going to highlight a couple of examples here. So this is a secondary analysis of the VAST trial, which took patients with septic shock and gave them norepinephrine or norepinephrine plus vasopressin. And you can see that among the patients who received more fluid, that they did worse. This is broken down by quartiles of fluid on the first day. And those with the highest quartiles of fluid had higher mortality and lower survival. Oops, sorry. Similarly, in the this is a similar study, 20,000 patients with sepsis in the premier database, 2013, and they looked at patients receiving more than five liters on day one, and you can see the predicted mortality goes up as you give more fluids in the green line, but so does the actual mortality, and once you get above five liters, that actual mortality far outpaces the predicted mortality, which breaks down to about a 2% increase in mortality per liter above five liters on day one, which is about a $1,000 hospital cost. The other evidence suggesting that there's harm from fluid, it comes from three trials that were done in uh, lower resource settings. So these trials, the FEAST trial, and then the simplified severe sepsis protocols basically gave patients large amounts of fluid, about 4,000 liters, um, uh, 4,000, sorry, 4,000 milliliters, four liters, um, as part of these sepsis bundles and show that there was increased harm when patients received more fluids. And actually several of these trials were stopped early due to the increased harm in the fluid bolus arms. Now, these are, trials are different than the trials in, in high-income high countries where we have more ability to deal with uh, complications of fluid overload, for example, the ability to intubate um, and more easily diarrhea start dialysis. But this should provide us a little bit of caution that maybe giving too much fluid um, is problematic. So the real question boils down to how do we find the optimal fluid value, volume? We want to avoid giving too little fluid because we want to avoid hyp organ hyperperfusion. But we also want to avoid giving too much fluid because we want to avoid those complications that can happen from organ edema. So really what we're trying to do is find what is that optimal fluid volume to give our patients. So to address that question, we're going to take a look at the stages of fluid resuscitation. So I think this is helpful for framing how we think about when we give fluids across the spectrum of a patient's presentation with sepsis. So this breaks down into four components. You have resuscitation, which is the early um, management of fluid within the first few minutes to hours. That's those initial boluses. Then you have optimization and stabilization. That's while your patient's in the ICU, do you keep in the remaining hypotensive? Do you keep giving them fluids? How do you find the optimal fluid balance while they're in the ICU? And then you have evacuation, which is how do you take fluids off once you've given a bunch of resuscitative fluids? And so we're going to break this down by each step and talk about the guidelines and the evidence at each step of the um, fluid administration uh, spectrum. So we're going to start with resuscitation. So those are the fluids that you give early in the first few minutes to hours. It's early adequate fluid management. 
So what do the guidelines say? So this is the 2021 Surviving Sepsis Guidelines that show that there's two guidelines that they recommend here. The first with initial resuscitation is based on best practice and says that sepsis and septic shock are medical emergencies and they recommend treating and resuscitating immediately, which makes sense. The second recommendation is the suggestion. Um, you can see it's a, based on a low quality evidence that they, for patients with sepsis induced hypotension or septic shock, they suggest at least 30 mils per kilogram of IV fluid within three hours of um, presentation. And now you can see this little note here that since between 2016 and 2021, over those five years, this recommendation was downgraded from a recommendation to give 30 mils per kilogram to a suggestion to give 30 mils per kilogram. And what does that even mean? So if we take a look at what the Surviving Sepsis Campaign says and the type statements that they make, we make a couple of different statements. The first is a we recommend, which is strong. And that should be interpreted that all or almost all informed people persons, providers would choose that intervention most of the time. So those are things that should be widely adopted. For example, then the best practice statement that we should respond to um, sepsis and treat it immediately and resuscitate immediately. However, a suggestion is based on, it's a weak recommendation based on low quality of evidence. And the takeaway from that is that most informed persons would choose the intervention, but it, there's still important variation among informed providers and it requires consideration and shared decision-making. So that's exactly what the 30 mils per kilogram recommendation is. It's a suggestion. And that has really evolved over time. So to understand why we ended up with this 30 mil per kilogram guideline, we have to go back um, to early goal directed therapy, which came out in 20, 2001 with the Rivers trial. Then in 2016, we moved to this recommendation to give 30 mils per kilogram. And then in 2021, that's downgraded to a suggestion. And why did that happen? So first, many of us have seen this. This is the 2001 Rivers trial. This is early goal-directed therapy, about 260 patients in the emergency room with sepsis. And they were randomized to get early goal-directed therapy via this algorithm, where basically you're giving fluids to maintain a CVP, vasoactive medications to maintain a MAP, et cetera, versus usual care. And this showed a really significant reduction in mortality by about 16%, from 46 to 30%. However, over time, once um, rivers got incorporated into normal care, people began moving away from early goal directed therapy. They began just giving fluids and vasopressors and using less central lines, using less uh, CVP, less um, central venous oxygen saturations, which led to the 2014-2015 series of trials called Arise, Process, and Promise. These were three different large multi-center trials that were done at various different countries, Australia, the UK, and the US, that compared the 2001 Rivers early goal directed therapy versus what had evolved to become the modern usual care, which was kind of just give a bunch of fluid and vasopressors and pay attention to patients with septic shock, notice them, triage them, and resuscitate them. And they found that there was no difference in mortality between this more prescriptive early goal directed therapy versus the new usual care. And that led the surviving substance campaign to update its recommendations in 2016 to make a recommendation for 30 mils per kilogram. Now, how did they choose 30 mils per kilogram? So that's an interesting story. It's basically circumstantial evidence. So they took a look. This is a individual patient meta, sorry, individual patient level meta analysis from Arise, Process, and Promise. And they basically took a look and saw, okay, in these patients who were enrolled in this trial, most of them had received about 30 mils per kilogram, 27 mils per kilogram medium was the median here of fluid before trial enrollment. So the surviving sepsis campaign took kind of a practical approach and said, let's choose that volume and make the recommendation because that seems to be a safe volume. That seems to be what most patients in this trial received. And there's also been some retrospective data that also supports this volume. So this is a trial, or this, sorry, this is a study, not a trial, it's a retrospective study of patients um, with, at, out of Kaiser by Dr. Liu and colleagues, and they had elevated lactates and they were looking at lactate clearance. But you can see here kind of a U-shaped curve where when patients got less than 15 mils per kilogram, they did worse. And when they got more than 45 mils per kilogram, they also did worse. Suggesting that maybe this 30 mils per kilogram is kind of a happy medium. Similarly, this was a more recent study out of um, China that looked at volumes of fluid that patients received um, on initial resuscitation, um, and they broke them down into three groups. They broke them down into the medium fluid group, which was 20 to 30 mils per kilogram versus less than 20 or more than 30 mils per kilogram. And you can see that patients in that medium fluid group had better survival. 
So again, some retrospective evidence supporting that maybe this kind of middle of the ground around 20 to 30 milligrams per kilogram is what we should be aiming for with fluid resuscitation. Now, there was a lot of concern about giving this much fluid in heart and renal failure. And so I really love this study. This is from Dr. Liu. Um, it was a, uh, also at Kaiser. So it's an implementation of a bundle. If you look to the bottom half of the, the figure here in outlined in gold uh, maze, um, you can see that of the patients, what they did is they they had implemented this bundle that included 30 mls per kilogram. And they look at before the bundle and then after the bundle mortality. And they break it down by patients who had baseline heart failure or kidney disease. This is that top row here, 8,000 patients versus those who had no heart failure or kidney disease. And you can see that implementation of the bundle decreased mortality by about 4% in the patients who had underlying heart failure or kidney disease, but actually had no difference in the patients who did not have baseline heart or kidney disease, suggesting that giving additional fluids as part of this bundle to patients who had heart failure and kidney disease actually improved their mortality. So after all of this, um, there's been a recent controversy, as some of you may know, that the CMS um, SEP1 bundle, which came out in 2015, but has evolved over time, includes this 30 mil per kilogram fluid at resuscitation in this bundle. And there's been a lot of controversy because despite the weak evidence I just showed you for this fluid resuscitation um, volume, this has become required as part of this bundle most recently this year as a process measure, or sorry, an outcome measure for hospitals. And so why are people upset about that requirement? Well, it's because there's a lot of limitations to the evidence that we have behind this 30 milligram per kilogram suggestion from the surviving sepsis campaign. And the biggest problem is this concept of confounding by indication. So I showed you a lot of retrospective studies that show that fluid volume is linked to mortality. Those who got too little fluid died more. Those who got too much fluid died more. But the problem with retrospective studies is we can never get around this confounding by indication. So the patients, we may have a bunch of markers for severity of illness, but we may not have all of them. And the problem is that if you're sicker, you may get more fluid and then die more. You may also get less fluid because you die more. So it's really hard to sort out how big of an effect the fluid volume is actually having on mortality. And the other concern is that the 30 mil per kilogram recommendation, all of the evidence I just showed you, ARISE, PROCESS, PROMISE, all of those retrospective studies were all patients admitted through the emergency department. But the SEP1 bundle is being applied to all patients, including patients you may triage as the ICU fellow on our floors who may have not just heart failure, but acute decompensated heart failure. So there's a lot of concern about applying this evidence as part of a required bundle. And the, we really need perspective validation of this 30 mil per kilogram. And like I mentioned, this is just a handful of the articles um, about how there, how much controversy there is about the step one bundle requirements, um, including that it's under fire, uh, it's driving blind, uh, patients need step one, why don't doctors like it? So there's been a lot of um, controversy and conversation about this over the past few years. And so one of the things I wanted to show today is what is actually happening in Michigan. So at the time, at this moment, though, the takeaway for resuscitation is that 30 mls per kilogram initial fluid bolus has limitations. Like I mentioned, there's been no randomized control trials that have enrolled patients early enough to study this initial fluid. And all the retrospective evidence we have, while we can take some aspects of it and interpret it, um, it does have risks for confounding. And we really need better ways to study and personalize this initial fluid resuscitation, for example, with pragmatic EHR embedded trials, which is one of my goals. In the meantime, I will give you this takeaway point that most patients probably need some fluid. And I left that intentionally very vague with most probably some, because I think that's how I, I feel about the current evidence. Um, I typically in my practice will aim for about 20 to 30 milligrams per kilogram. Um, and I'll do that even in patients with heart failure or renal failure, as long as they don't have acute symptoms of volume overload. Um, and so that's kind of my approach is to give some fluid as an initial fluid to most patients, unless there's a um, clear, clear contraindication based on exam or other findings. So another, before we move on from resuscitation, I just want to pause and have a word about resuscitation fluid type. So the Surviving Sepsis Campaign 2021 guidelines recommend that for patients with septic or septic shock, we suggest using crystalloids instead of normal, balanced crystalloids instead of normal saline for resuscitation. 
And this is a suggestion um, based on low quality evidence. But I think by the next time we update these guidelines, that evidence is going to increase and this will probably become a recommendation. Because since that the guidelines were published, we've had a Bayesian, um, sorry, this should be 2022, this is newer, uh, a Bayesian reanalysis of 13 randomized control trials with over 30,000 participants. So basically, there's been a lot of trials looking at balanced fluid versus normal saline, and a lot of them have had neutral results. But when you pool them together and use a Bayesian approach, looking at the um, prior probability of balanced fluid being better, and then incorporating the results from these 30,000 patients, you get an 89.5% probability that balanced fluids lower mortality compared to normal saline. And now that effect size is, is small, zero to 9%, depending on the estimates from the analyses. But you know, if we can decrease mortality by a few percent by choosing lactated ringers or other balanced fluid over normal saline, that's something that we should be implementing. So coming back to the stages of fluid resuscitation, we've spent a lot of time talking about resuscitation, those first few minutes to hours, of how much fluid that you give, what type of fluid. Then you move into the second phase of optimization and stabilization. So this is this late conservative fluid management. And the surviving sepsis campaign in this, in this period of ongoing fluid resuscitation makes not just a suggestion or a weak recommendation, it makes no recommendation. And that's because, as they show here, there's insufficient evidence to make a recommendation on the use of restrictive versus liberal fluid strategies in the first 24 hours of resuscitation. And why do they make no recommendation? So this was a 20, it, this recommend, no recommendation was based on this 2020 meta-analysis of several studies looking at ongoing fluids. So all of these started, studies started after initial fluid, looking at once you've given the initial few liters, should you take a restrictive or a liberal approach to additional fluid? And you can see that they're all very small studies, though only a handful of the top four there actually had a successful fluid, fluid separation between the groups, meaning the arms actually got different amounts of fluid. But you can see even taking that into account that there was no difference in, um, between getting lower volumes of fluid or higher volumes of fluid on mortality across these, uh, these small trials. Since 2020, we've had updated evidence from classics and clovers, which I'll go through here, but um, long story short, doesn't really change the recommendation for no recommendation, although provides higher quality evidence to support no recommendation. So the first was the 2022 classics trial, which um, we've talked a little bit about in my uh, other presentations, but basically was a trial of 1,500 patients in Europe. Um, with septic shock in the ICU. So these are pretty sick patients. They're in the ICU, they have septic shock, and they're enrolled after about 3,000 mils of initial fluid um, on average, and they're randomized to receive fluid restriction versus standard therapy for the duration of their ICU stay. So what did that look like? So in gray are the things between the intervention and the control that were similar, that they could give fluid to replace documented losses and correct dehydration. But what was different was in the intervention fluid restriction arm, fluid boluses were only allowed for very strict clinical criteria, lactates greater than floor, MAPs less than 50, versus in the control, fluid boluses could be given throughout the ICU course for any number of um, hemodynamic factors, any elevated lactate, any hypotension. The other major difference was that in the intervention arm with fluid restriction, there was no maintenance IV fluids allowed versus in the control, maintenance fluids were allowed for the local ICU protocols across these multiple ICUs. So basically the classic trial was a trial of tightening the parameters for fluid boluses and eliminating maintenance fluids during a patient's ICU stay. And so when we do that, when we tighten those parameters for fluid bolus and eliminate maintenance fluids, there is unfortunately no difference in outcomes. So here you can see the restrictive group versus the standard group, and both had a very high mortality. These were really sick patients, 42%, but there was no difference in mortality. There's also no difference in serious adverse events. So here you have um, overall adverse events as well as by ischemia and acute kidney injury, and there was no difference between the restrictive or the standard therapy. Now, when you look at the subgroups, there is a potential signal that fluid restriction may be better for those on respiratory support. This as indicated by the orange arrow here, those are patients on either non-invasive um, ventilation or invasive mechanical ventilation. Um, you can see that it doesn't fully cross significance, but it, it, that's probably due to the um, being underpowered. These subgroups only had about 300 patients, but it does suggest that fluid restriction may be better for patients um, on requiring non-invasive or invasive mechanical ventilation. 
So one of the biggest criticisms of the class X trial was that the separation between the fluid arms was of unclear clinical significance. So you can see here, this is after day one fluids. This is in after the initial three liters that many of these patients got coming into the trial, the restricted fluid group got an additional median of 500 cc's versus the standard fluid group got additional median of 1.3 liters. And so the question is, is that difference of 800 or so um, milliliters out of the total three to 5,000 liters, milliliters these patients got on day one, is that actually enough to make a difference or that we'd expect it to improve mortality? And I don't actually know. But what I take away from classics is that for patients in the ICU with septic shock, after the initial fluid resuscitation, it's reasonable to limit ongoing fluid boluses and avoid maintenance IV fluids, which is our practice here at Michigan anyway, particularly in patients with respiratory failure. So what about the CLOVERS trial? So I mentioned this at the beginning, but basically in 2023, the CLOVERS trial came out. It was 1,500 patients across U.S. hospitals that looked at sepsis-induced hypotension, mostly in the emergency room. 91% were admitted through the ED. And these patients were a little less sick because they were caught in the more the initial hypotension phase rather than having to have septic shock. They were enrolled after a little less fluid, two liters instead of three plus liters in the classics trial. And the intervention was different. So the intervention here was to look at restrictive fluids and early vasopressors versus liberal fluids for 24 hours. So it was a shorter intervention. And now what did that mean? So after the initial one to three liters of initial fluid, patients enrolled in the CLOVERS protocol were randomized to either the intervention where basically if they had ongoing hypotension, they were started on vasopressors and given fluid only for very strict criteria, for example, MAP less than 50 or decreased urine output, like severe oligurian. Or they were in the control arm where if they had ongoing hypotension after that initial fluid, they were just given fluid boluses to maintain their blood pressure up to five liters, and then they were switched over to vasopressors. So when you look at did this intervention work um, and create a difference between the groups, it did. So in the first 24 hours, patients in the restricted fluid group got only 1,200 additional cc's compared to patients in the liberal fluid group got 3,000. And patients in the restricted fluid group got more vasopressors, as you'd expect, 59% versus 37%. But as I mentioned before, there was no difference in the primary outcome of discharge home by 90 days, 14%. So compared to classics, you can see these were a lot healthier patients. The mortality was only 14% compared to 40 plus percent. But there was also no difference in serious adverse events. So what I take away is that when it comes to this question of early vasopressors versus giving more fluids, that there's no difference. And after an initial one to three liters of fluid, either approach is reasonable. Now, the problem is, as I highlighted earlier, that there are several limitations to classics and clovers. So first of all, as I've mentioned, they enroll patients after an initial one, two to three plus liters of fluid. So it doesn't tell us anything about what to do up front with that initial fluid resuscitation. And then secondly, they used a one size fits all approach, which may not be the best approach to giving additional fluid. As many of you said in the initial case, you wanted to do an assessment of fluid responsiveness to decide whether you were gonna give more fluid. Now you could have done this on this trial, but you, you wouldn't have been able to act on that information. You would have been giving more fluid or giving vasopressors based on the trial arm, not based on your bedside assessment. So that's a problem because there's this concept of average treatment effect in clinical trials. So basically the average treatment effect can be null. For example, in these classics and clovers, there was no difference, but the question is, is there a group of patients who benefited from more, the restrictive fluid approach or were harmed by the restrictive fluid approach? And how do we find out who those patients are? And some group analyses are one approach, but there, as we saw in classics, there's limited power in these subgroup analyses because you only have about 300 patients on respiratory support. So it's hard to tell whether or not that's a actually driving some of this treatment effect. And so this is one of the major challenges we have with clinical trials in this area. And it really boils down to this question of how can we personalize fluid resuscitation? So this trial from Benser um, in JAMA in 2016 showed that once patients arrive in the ICU, only 50% of them are actually fluid responsive. So how do we, if we're just randomly giving 50% of those patients fluid restriction or liberal fluids, how do we actually identify the patients who need the additional fluids and how do we target them so that we can give the fluids to the patients who need them? So one possible approach is using clinical factors. So that's easy to assess at bedside. What is oxygen are they on? What is their history? There has been limited information looking at how what cl 
cl how clinicians use clinical factors to look at fluid resuscitation. So one of my pro um, projects has been to do a randomized vignette survey of 550 ICU providers in the Society of Critical Mer Care Medicine. And we presented them with six sepsis cases and we randomized the clinical factors in the cases and assessed the impact of those factors on their decisions about fluids and vasopressors. So this case is similar to the one that you guys took at the beginning. It's a little bit, a little bit more detail, but you can see here that the, it's a patient with pneumonia coming in and instead of just getting seeing six liters nasal cannula, you might see room air six liters or 50% face mask, depending on how the case was randomized. Similarly, we randomized respiratory rate, fluid volume received, one, two, or five liters, and then map after the fluids, 52, 58, or 64. And then we asked a very similar question that you guys saw at the beginning. So we found that some of the clinical factors were more important than others. And the most important was how much fluid the patient had already gotten. So this is the adjusted portion of respondents that when given the case would give an additional, um, give additional fluids. You can see if the patient in the case had only had one liter, about 75% would give additional fluids, um, which is actually less than you'd expect based on 30 mils per kilogram. But once you get up to five liters, you can see that only 20% would give additional fluids. In contrast, in the kind of lighter green color, you can see that as the patient in the case had, the, had more fluids given, that the provider or the respondent to the case was more likely to say that they would start vasopressors. In contrast, MAP had a slightly different effect. So you can see that in the dark green, the amount of the MAP 64, 58, or 52 didn't really have an effect on people's decision to give fluids, but it had kind of a step up effect on giving starting vasopressors. So at a MAP of 64, about 60% would start vasopressors versus when you show the respondent a lower MAP of 58 or 52, many more providers would start um, vasopressors. So clearly providers are using clinical factors to make these decisions. And some of those clinical factors are more impactful than others. So like I showed you, the fluid volume received is probably the most impactful factor. MAP has more of an impact on vasopressor decision. The other factors, volume status exam being wet or dry based on exam, respiratory status being on six liters versus um, room air also had an impact. But interestingly, things like history of heart failure or lactate trend with fluids and AKI had minimal impact on these decisions. And then interestingly, people wanted more. So this, uh, I think, want to thank Kevin Carlick, one of our residents here who helped me do this analysis. Basically, we will ask, we let people write in what more information they wanted. Um, and respondents were frequently requesting other tools to assess fluid responsiveness. So you can see here most commonly outlined in red, they wanted point of care cardiac ultrasound, formal echo, they wanted passive leg raise, they wanted non-invasive cardiac output monitoring, and down here a couple handful wanted CVP, et cetera. So providers are wanting more information, just like you guys did, to make these decisions about giving more fluids. So what does the Surviving Sepsis Campaign say about guiding additional fluid resuscitation using these tools for assessing fluid responsiveness? So they make three suggestions. So you can see these are based on weak recommendations based on low quality evidence, but they suggest guiding fluid to decrease serum lactate. That makes sense. They suggest guiding fluids to using capillary refill time, and they suggest guiding fluids using dynamic measures. So let's take a look behind the evidence behind those suggestions. So the lactate trend in capillary refill time came out of this Andromeda shock trial, which came out a few years ago with 400 patients in septic shock. And in the trial, they gave additional fluids after the initial resuscitation to either normalize the lactate or with the goal of normalizing the lactate versus to normalize the capillary refill time. And overall, there was no difference in mortality. But you can see here in figure three, which was the subgroup analyses, that in patients with a low Apache score, less than 25, or with a low SOFA score, less than 10, that, that capillary guiding additional resuscitation based on capillary refill time improved mortality compared to using lactate trends. And that's interesting because overall, those patients didn't actually get more or less fluid. So it wasn't a huge difference in total fluid volume, just 400 and less than 400 cc's. It was about 380 cc's difference. So the question is, was capillary refill time actually helping the providers give fluids to the right patient in the study? And I think that's the really interesting question that you know we'll never know because it's hard to really measure how did you target the fluid resuscitation. But perhaps that's why capillary refill time was better than using a lactate trend.
So what about dynamic measures, or tools for assessing um, fluid responsiveness? So I this is a, um, a large table, and I just leave this up here because I want you to know it exists, um, and we'll break through some of this evidence. But basically, this is from this uh, JAMA paper by Ben Sir, and it takes all of these dynamic measures that we use to assess fluid responsiveness, including pulse pressure variation, IVC um, assessment on ultrasound, and it looks through all of the studies that were available at the time, this small number of studies, but um, zero to 17, and then it figures out the testing characteristics, the sensitivity, the specificity, positive likelihood ratio, negative likelihood ratio, and diagnostic odds ratio. So I think it's just a wonderful um, tool to take a look at the tool that you use the most at bedside. So I um, used to favor IVC assessment. I can come here and see, oh, wow, that's if for my patient who's um, on mechanical ventilation, my sensitivity is okay, 77. But if they're spontaneously breathing, that may not be the best test. That's pretty terrible sensitivity. So it's just a great place to go to reference to get a better understanding of the tool that you prefer to use. And I want to highlight here that this is assessment of fluid responsiveness. And what does that mean? This is testing that if you have a patient who's hypotensive, will giving them a fluid bolus increase their cardiac output? So this isn't, you know, is this patient overloaded or dry? That's not what these are assessing. It's not for a patient who's sitting on the floor or like even in your clinic office, completely um, normotensive. That's not the patients that these were tested in. This is hypotensive patients will giving a fluid bolus increase their cardiac output. That's what these testing characteristics are looking at. So taking a look through um, some of the evidence, static CVP um, is included in this list, even though dynamic measures are preferred. And it makes sense that dynamic measures are preferred because you can see here, this is um, comparing the static CVP measurement versus a patient's um, volume status measured invasively. And you can see that there is uh, basically no correlation. So while multiple um, trends of CVP may be helpful, we don't have great evidence for that, but some patient people use trends of CVP, a one-time static CVP is probably very unhelpful. Um, so the other, this is the dynamic measures that they include. Um, and yes, Colin brings um, up that it's that those testing characteristics are not assessing a provider's ability to interpret the results, which is so true. And it's one of the limitations, especially to um, IVC collapsibility, which I've used um, a lot, is that it varies between providers um, and is a, is a huge problem um, with these measures. Um, so this is the dynamic measures of fluid responsiveness. And this is using the diagnostic odds ratio, which is basically the odds of a positive test if the patient's fluid responsive versus the odds of a positive test if they're not fluid responsive. Um, so you can see that the higher the diagnostic odds ratio, the better the test. So pulse pressure variation um, cannot has not really been tested in patients who aren't intubated. And if they are intubated, does a little bit better if you have them on higher tidal volumes. IVC collapsibility has only been really evaluated in patients who are intubated on high tidal volumes, which is already a starting problem because we don't really have our patients on seven plus cc's per keg. And then in non-intubated patients, it does pretty terribly. Versus change in stroke volume or cardiac output with a passive leg raise does pretty well. So what are each of those tests? So pulse pressure variation is something that you can get from the monitor. You can click on the art line reading. You have to have an arterial line. You can click on the arterial line reading and you can look at this difference in the pulse pressure when someone's breathing in and breathing out. It can only be done when the patient's intubated. And if they have a large pulse pressure variation of more than eight to 11%, that predicts fluid responsiveness. That means that the um, basically it's kind of like IVC collapsibility. Your vein is um, varying a lot. And so they may respond to fluids, but it has a lot of limits highlighted by this very cute mnemonic limits, um, where especially because this uses heart rate, um, any irregular heartbeat, anyone in AFib, anyone with bradycardia, patients who are intubated with low tidal volumes, who have increased abdominal pressure, just so many things that happen with our patients in the ICU that limit the ability to use pulse pressure variation. So it works okay if you have the right scenario and you have a patient with an A-line, which we're also moving away from. Um, so what about IVC collapsibility? So this was my prior test of choice and you, similar concept where that high IVC collapsibility index dictates that they might, indicates that they might be fluid responsive, different cutoffs if they're intubated or not intubated. And you can see that's actually, that's not just kind of how big the IVC is, that's a measure of the maximum IVC diameter minus the minimum over the maximum. So it's a collapsibility index. And like Colin mentioned, has really bad a lot of issues with interrelator reliability with about an estimated 10% um, uh, discordance in people reading results. 
not to mention even performing the ultrasound. So what about this more promising change in cardiac output after fluid challenge? So a change in cardiac output of more than a stroke volume of more than 10% with fluid challenge suggests fluid responsiveness. And you can give that fluid challenge in two ways. You can give a fluid bolus or you can do a passive leg raise, which basically gives an auto bolus. Um, challenging to do in our beds, um, but is been proven to, to correlate with giving about a 250 to 300 cc bolus. And the beautiful beauty is then you can just flip them back up and take the bolus away um, if it goes poorly. But then how do you measure the cardiac output and stroke volume? So there are many new non-invasive technologies to help us measure these responses to a fluid bolus. This is, again, data from HMS that looks at the use of non-invasive monitoring devices routinely in the ICU. You can see that two thirds of hospitals are not using any, which I'd say I put us there because we're not really using any of these non-invasive devices, but that everyone else is using a variety of different devices. But really, I want to spend a, a few minutes talking about the best studied one, which is this uh, NICOM, non-invasive cardiac output monitor, or it's also called Starlink from Baxter. So basically, this is a monitor you can see you put on stickers above and below the heart. And it measures its bioreactance, which measures phase shifts across the heart to determine the change in stroke volume on this little monitor. And it spits out the results in a really user-friendly fashion. And it is actually coming to 5D and 6D very soon. Um, and so we're very excited to be having this coming here. We'll be doing a fellow SIM session on February 6th to talk about how to use it. So there'll be more to come on this. But I want to talk about why we chose NICOM and what the evidence is to support that. So this is a retrospective study out of the University of Kansas where they had ICU patients with additional fluid. Again, this is like once they arrive in the ICU, they got IV fluids guided by non-invasive cardiac output monitor versus usual care. And you can see that the patients in the dark black who got the stroke volume or NICOM got it, fluids got less fluid. They also had less intubation dialysis, shorter ICU stays, and shorter vasopressor duration. But that's retrospective evidence. So what about prospective evidence? So that's where the FRESH trial gives us some information. So this was a multicenter trial published in 2020 that was 120 patients with sepsis and hypotension admitted from the ER. And after they'd gotten their initial fluid, about two liters, they were randomized to get either stroke volume guided resuscitation with the NICOM using this protocol where they had the NICOM to assess stroke volume change and were either given fluids or vasopressors depending on the response versus usual care. Patients who got the NICOM guided fluid intervention received less fluid, which was the primary outcome. And after their initial fluid, they only got 650 more cc's versus two liters within 72 hours. And that kind of less fluid held at all sorts of time points. But most importantly, they also had a uh, improved patient outcomes. So the while this was just a pilot study with only 120 patients, even among that, the patients who received the stroke volume guided resuscitation had less dialysis, less intubation, and more discharge home. So NICOM is a really promising tool in the ICU. It's coming to our ICU soon. But one of the questions I have for my future research directions is, is this a tool that can actually also help us guide early fluid resuscitation? So the takeaway from fluid responsiveness me measures are that there's many tools for measuring fluid responsiveness. Dynamic measures are definitely preferred over static measures. You should know the limitations, like Colin mentioned, of your preferred tool, and that stroke volume guided resuscitation using NICOM is really the best studied at this point. And so what do I do? I use a combination of all of these things, and I'm really excited that NICOM is coming because I think it will be a helpful tool once it gets here. So in the last few minutes, I want to talk about the last stage, evacuation. So this is the late conservative fluid management and late goal-directed fluid removal. So, so far we've talked about when do you give fluids on, but how do you take them off and why does it matter? So it matters because what we've just spent this last uh, 45, 50 minutes talking about is giving fluid, but only 6.5% of fluid is given as resuscitative fluid or fluid boluses. The rest, as you can see here in blue, is either maintenance fluids, which we don't do here, but also, you get fluid creep from medications. You get nutrition, oral intake. So how can we evacuate that fluid? There's two main approaches. There's passive de-escalation, and then there's de-resuscitation, which is an active process of fluid removal. So de-escalation is this concept of passively de-escalating fluids by minimizing maintenance fluid and avoiding fluid creep by transitioning IV medicines to PO, for example. And that's really what was studied in the classic trial. 
In contrast, deresuscitation is active fluid removal with diuretics or dialysis. And this is a really exciting emerging field in fluid resuscitation, although there's pretty limited studies to date. The one I just want to highlight is this RADAR2 feasibility trial. And again, it was just a feasibility trial, but it was it gives an idea of what the concept of deresuscitation is. So this was 180 intubated, critically ill ICU patients. They only 40% had sepsis. So all these studies have been pretty broad. And they compared intervention versus usual care for days two through five in the ICU. An intervention was de-escalation, which was stopping maintenance fluid, and then de-resuscitation, which was when the patient hit a net fluid balance of more than two liters or clinical edema and was improving in their shock so that they were less than 0.2 of neuroepi and their lactate was coming down. They, were de they received Lasix and spironolactone for diuresis for a net goal of minus one to three liters per day. And it worked in that patients in the intervention in this blue arm received a got more fluid off. So you can see after day two, they were able to start removing fluids. They had more hypernatremia and alkalosis, which makes sense. They were being pretty actively diuresed, but there was no difference in outcomes. But again, this was a small pilot trial, so hard to interpret and an interesting concept of um, kind of how you might be able to de-resuscitate uh, and how we might be able to use this concept in future trials. There's also, I just want to spend a brief second on the tools to determine when to de-resuscitate, because just like I talked about tools for when to give fluid, you can also think about, well, when should I start taking fluid off? So some studies have looked at the absence of preload on passive leg raise. It's just the vice versa. When the passive leg raise is negative, you start taking fluid off. Um, that's been, had some decent evidence in dialysis patients. There's this vexus, which is venous congestion by ultrasound, where you basically look at the flow through the hepatic portal and intrarenal veins to just see if someone's congested. That has had some evidence. And then there's also this really cool concept of extra, extravascular lung water index, which does a decent job of predicting fluid overload and mortality, but is a thermodilution method that requires a central line, an arterial line, and a ventilator, which many of our patients don't have. So really, we don't have an optimal tool to resuscitate, and we don't really have an optimal tool to de-resuscitate at this time. So the takeaway from de-resuscitation is that there's no good evidence-based approach yet. Most of the evidence is from small trials, and we really need more studies. But in general, minimizing maintenance and ongoing fluids and starting to remove fluids once a patient's out of severe shock is a reasonable approach. So with that, I'll wrap up with my conclusions that Optimizing fluid balance is really kind of this holy grail of um, early sepsis management. Most patients need some fluid. We don't know exactly how much. And after you give that initial fluid, either liberal or restrictive approaches are reasonable. Using dynamic tools is helpful, especially NICOM, which I'm really excited that we're getting here in a few months, and that you should be actively thinking about de-escalating and de-resuscitating in your patients, and that hopefully we'll have more studies to address those issues soon. So with that, I'd like to um, take any questions as well as thank my, men my mentor, Hallie, as well as my co-mentors, the HMS team, and then for this NICOM project, working closely with the Michigan Medicine Sepsis Quality Team um, who've been incredibly helpful with and um, Im important in bringing this tool to us. Thanks so much, uh, Elizabeth. Any questions or comments? VA, the VA room is celebrating. I think they're impressed. <laughs> I'll ask one. <clears throat> um, Elizabeth, awesome, awesome talk, really elegant presentation about just a, a lot of work, a lot of which was your own. Um, I'm gonna put you on the spot and give a very like macro skeptical take on all this. Uh, based on two observations. One is, if I followed really the first half of your talk, when it comes to fluid resuscitation, the, the better the quality of evidence, the less it seems to matter. Like as you, as you go from sort of confounded observational studies to RCTs, we don't see much of a delta with, with in terms of real patient outcomes with the caveats that, you know, like they're already getting some upfront resuscitation and we're within a, a range and it's not tailored to the patient. So that's, that's a, a huge caveat. Two, when you, you did a really nice job of explaining what you mean and what we mean by fluid responsive. And the underlying assumption, I think, is 
you need to know who would have improved cardiac output because that would translate into improved delivery of oxygen to tissues with the assumption being that organs are failing because they're hypoperfused. They're not getting enough oxygen. And, and my pushback would be, we have actually lots of evidence that just improving oxygen delivery doesn't translate into good outcomes, right? So red blood cells or higher MAP targets or dobutamine, which we tried, all these things augment delivery, granted in a one size fits all way, but, uh, and none of those translated into, into sort of actionable interventions that, that save people. So my, my skeptical pushback would be this is maybe organs are failing for other reasons. Maybe it's immunologic or metabolic or microbiologic, all these other pathways that are actually why organs fail and people die in sepsis. And within normal practice now, the variation doesn't translate. And, and huge caveat, this is not tailored to individual patients. So I wonder what you think about that. Is that is that just a sort of nihilist perspective or do you think there's actually room for room for improving outcomes with this? Yeah, so I think that's a great point and something I've thought a lot about, obviously. Um, I think the point you made about the fluid responsiveness and does that actually help patient outcomes, as far as I know, the FRESH trial is really the only one, and it was just a pilot trial that has like linked using fluid responsiveness to improving organ outcomes. Everything that to date had been kind of, well, initially it was give more fluids, but along with rivers and early fluid resuscitation came earlier recognition of sepsis, earlier response to sepsis. So maybe it wasn't the fluids, it was just paying attention to sepsis. And then kind of flipped in the last five to 10 years where it's like fluids are bad. And all of the studies have talked about getting away from fluids, stop giving fluids. And we're just now getting into the point of saying, well, what if we, how do you target fluids? And does that actually improve patient outcomes? Because none of those other um, uh, measure, like that whole table of fluid responsiveness, the outcome is, do they, does the cardiac output go up? It's not, does the tissue get more perfusion? It's not, do they improve outcomes? So I think that's why I'm encouraged by the FRESH trial and why I think NICOM is a promising tool because short of that, you're right, does it even matter how much fluid we give? If we give more than five liters, maybe we're getting into trouble. But what if we, if we give zero, maybe we're getting into trouble. But as long as there's some fluid in the tank, maybe we're okay. But I do think there's room to start to, it hasn't been done yet to tailor it. And I may 10 years now have the trial, I'd be like, it didn't make a difference. <laughs> but I think yeah. it's the question that hasn't been asked and is something that is being used at bedside without evidence in that we're all trying to find that answer. And so if we can say it doesn't matter, that I think is also helpful because it will save time and resources at the bedside of trying to do the passive leg raise and do all these things when maybe it didn't matter. Yeah, I I, I think that's the right answer. I think there's, I mean, we're, we're supposed to be in the era of precision medicine and we're still giving these clunky one size fits all therapies. I'm just really skeptical of physiologic proxies, right? Like if, yeah. if with ARDS, we just, we just went after oxygenation, we would not be using long protective ventilation. We'd be using the oscillator. We, we, we know how to improve oxygenation and hurt patients. So I, I, I appreciate that you're trying to both tailor therapies, but also I know you ultimately want to improve outcomes not just physiologic yeah. proxies. So. Yeah. And I think that's a huge problem in all the data. It's all been physiological outcomes. Um, versus I want to look at things like, and it's because there is no way to say, did you target it? Like we don't, the, yeah. I've thought a lot about what's the best outcome for this trial, because how do you know you targeted it? Right. I don't know. We don't have a good measure for that. So um, yeah, that, those are important questions. I think Doug has a question. My, I, I can't see myself or anybody else, so I'm just wondering. So, Elizabeth, I, I'm going to carry Bob's comment maybe a little bit farther. So, you know, our literature is littered with uh, studies that showed interventions that improve oxygenation. And I think, Bob, you were just alluding to this, is that we can do a lot of things that improve oxygenation. Very few of them have ever been tied to improve mortality, and some, in fact, have been tied to just the opposite. And, and so what I learned from this is that, you know, our ventilator strategies are about uh, keeping the patient alive without doing any damage to the lung, because damage to the lung probably causes IL-6 and all these other things to be released, and then other organs fail, and that's when mortality goes up. So we can treat respiratory failure, keep the patient long enough, uh, alive long enough for their, for their, uh, you know, their their organs to stop failing, so to speak, or to prevent additional organ failure. So I, I think of sepsis is the same way. We have these interventions that improve physiologic parameters, and and and, you know what is the damage we're doing, you know, when we over resuscitate people and can we focus on that? Like we, we focus on stretch related damage in the lungs. That's, I guess, one question I want you to ponder out loud if you can. Um, and, and also maybe 
plant the seed that this, there's something in the microcirculation that's just dysregulated in patients who are septic that causes organ failure and and what other than fluid oppressors are going to restore you know local uh, microcirculatory control to keep little cells from dying at the end of the road yeah those are great questions so i think the how do we look at how do we not do harm i think we need to link I mean, this is a problem with all clinical care trials is that we use mortality, but I think we need to link this to longer term outcomes if we can. So perhaps we would see a difference. And you can imagine if you're over resuscitating someone and giving them enough edema, they can't get out of bed, then maybe they have worse functional impairment. But perhaps if you keep their brain under perfused while you're trying to get the vasopressor started, and that's why I'm interested in peripheral vasopressors, getting the vasopressor started, getting their maps up, we're perfusing, trying to perfuse the microcirculation, you might have some co more cognitive impairment if you under resuscitate. So I think we need to link the outcomes of these approaches to fluid resuscitation to longer term outcomes. Maybe we'll see some signal there, but I don't have any hope that fluid is going to improve microcirculation or honestly, I don't think it's going to improve outcomes that much. I think it's more of a, how do we stop doing harm and how do we kind of like at the bedside decide how much fluid to give so that we're not doing harm, um, and cut either direction. Um, and then having other people, uh, also work on these tools of immunomodulation and microcirculation. And how do we address those things that are happening in conjunct? Cause I don't think this kind of, um, mashing on the keyboard of fluids is going to fix any of those problems. Yeah. Um, Channel my inner, inner West Ely, you know, the long-term outcomes really sort of pique my interest, which is to say that, you know, ultimately those are the ones that matter, right? Can the patient read and do the crossword puzzle six months from now, or are they right. still infused and delirious and, and recovering from uh, whatever CNS damage we've done? Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Liz. For the trainees, come to Michigan and Elizabeth will teach you how to mash on the keyboard of fluids. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. <clears throat> and thanks everybody. Uh, if the applicants could stay on for just two minutes, uh, that would be great. But thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thank you guys.